a beast-like whale, rent the air. The two visitors to the Tala mission station stood dumb and frightened. A woman, the living image of a demon, tore past them. Frightened people from the house out of which he ran stood helpless. One of them said, Lord, rather kill her than torture her like this. He forgave her by Herbert Lomo. Tribal social sanctions meant nothing to them. True, in and around the mission stations from which they came and where their parents and relatives lived, tribal Africans still adhered to the ancient customs. Most of the families of the tribesmen were either consanguine or conjugal and all observed jealously the old moral codes. But some of the younger people who worked in Durban and returned home at weekly, monthly or longer intervals adhered strictly neither to tribal nor to Christian morals, especially in their sex relations. It was not that they were corrupt and decadent. They were proud of their families and personal reputations, afraid of being disgraced and to all appearances lived a decent life. Unfortunately, most of them had succumbed to the practice of free love. Tsingo Guma and Dudung Kehli belonged to this group. Both came from respectable and well-known families in the Tala Mission Station. They were engaged to be married. As the Lobola fees had been heavy and their wedding would necessarily be costly owing to the social status of the two families, it was decided to postpone the wedding for some time. Dudu was engaged as a domestic servant at some rich European family in the Berea. She had a room of her own in the large backyard. Tsingo was a second grade clerk at the local office of the Native Affairs Department and supplemented his earnings by teaching at a night school on four evenings of the week. A studious and ambitious young man, he was studying privately in order to qualify as a first grade clerk. Proud and sensitive, he behaved conventionally but could never forget an insult or injury, which he was careful neither to give nor deserve. Friday, Saturday and Sunday nights, Tsingo spent with Dudu, but, devoted as he was to his work, studies and night school job, he could not afford to visit her on the other days. There was a mutual agreement between them about this, and he strictly adhered to the program. Every Thursday afternoon, which was a day off, Dudu went downtown to clean Tingo's room and do his washing and ironing. She had a duplicate key to his room, as she always came before he returned from work. He, too, had a key to her room, as very often... He came either too early before her duties were over, or, if detained by friends or at some meeting, too late when she was already in bed. Like many others of the type and class, most of whom knew nothing about contraceptives, and the few who knew either did not believe in them or thought them not the right things to use, the one great fear and anxiety was that their free love might lead to disgraceful physical results. But they comforted themselves with the fact that, since they were engaged, if such a tragedy came to pass, they would immediately get married and escape shame and contumely. These arrangements went on smoothly for about three months. Ish, I don't know why, but I feel I must visit Dudu tonight, said Tringo to James, 
his best friend and mission home neighbor. It was very late on a Wednesday night. The moon was a brilliant crescent shedding powerful light. The two young men had returned from their night school duties and were in James's room, where they had been discussing several topics and enjoying light refreshments. They shared confidences and it had long been arranged that James would be the best man at his friend's wedding. It is rather late, M. Fan. Not quite safe to be moving about, said James. Tlingo insisted that he would go. I don't like it. I am superstitious, warned James. People who suddenly decide to do unusual things are often called by danger or even death. Klingo laughed off all his friend's warnings, saying he did not care about the police and the moonlight would render him safe against thugs. Sometimes moonlight is more dangerous than a dark night and light more treacherous than the dark. But as you insist on going, here, take this, said James, handing his revolver to Tlingo. And do be careful. It is a danger in itself, although it is a protection from danger. And as you know, we have no right to possess arms. Tlingo thanked him simply but warmly, pocketed the firearm and immediately left. Klingo reached Dudu's room without trouble. As he was about to put his key into the keyhole, it occurred to him that she might have left her own key in from the inside and he would be obliged to knock at the door or window in order to awaken her. Fortunately, it was not so. He pushed the door open slowly. The moonlight pouring through the window allowed him to distinguish objects in the room. Then, Klingo stood numb and trembling. He could not believe his own eyes. Perhaps it was the poor and deceitful light shed by the moon. He closed the door and locked the door quietly from the inside and strained his eyes to make sure that what he thought he saw was not an illusion. His mind was in a haze and his heart was a noisy hammer that he thought might disturb everyone's peace. At last, he decided to switch on the light in the hope that it was not A, but A. He could not even mention the words to himself. The flood of light confirmed what he had already seen and knew. No. It was not a girl visitor, but a man sleeping with her. They were fast asleep and the sudden flood of light did not awaken them. In a flash, his mind was made up and something cold entered his soul and gave it inexplicable peace. He sat down at the table, took a small book of essays from his pocket and began to read. He did not take in what he read, for his mind was far away. After a few moments of ominous silence, Dudu suddenly awoke, raised her head, rubbed her eyes. When she saw him sitting quietly and reading, she uttered a cry of fear and utter misery and covered her head with the blankets. This awakened a secret lover, a giant of a man. Sensing trouble even before he saw Tlingo, the giant jumped up like a lion, ready to attack. Tlingo made not a movement, nor uttered a word, although he was all alert. Who are you? And what do you want here? roared the giant, coming forward to fight. 
Do you know what this is? Said Gringo calmly as he produced the revolver and covered the man. A change came over the giant at once. He turned dark and started perspiring. He suddenly looked afraid. Please, please don't shoot, brother. Don't, don't, don't shoot. He pleaded. Did she tell you about me? God knows, brother. No, no. Please don't shoot. Don't shoot. Put on your clothes and go now. Thanks, thanks, my lord. Thanks. Really, really. I, I, I did not know. Trembling and unable to take his eyes off Tringo and the revolver, the giant blundered into his clothes, moved backwards towards the door, clumsily unlocked it, and uttering a cry of fear as if Tringo would shoot at the last moment, threw it open swiftly and bolted away. All the time, Dudu was covered up and sobbing. As soon as the man had left, Tringo stood up calmly, went and locked the door, undressed steadily, switched off the light and got into bed. The next day was Thursday, Dudu's day to go and tidy Tringo's room. On Friday evening, when she returned to her room after work, she found a letter that had been pushed in under the door. It was a most difficult thing to tear open that letter, which she knew contained, as it were, her fate and future. Darling, what is wrong? Yesterday morning you slipped out of bed very early before I awoke and did not bid me good morning or prepare me a cup of tea. I also expected you as usual in my room yesterday. But you failed to come. This is most unusual and unkind of you. Yes, yes, of course I know. But I also understand. That is what you do not understand. We are all human and to err is human. Perhaps we men are worse sinners. No more on that. I'll call you as usual tomorrow evening. My duty is to forgive, yours to believe and forget. Always yours. Tringo. Before she read to the end, the letter fluttered out of Dudu's hand and she broke down and wept bitterly. My God! It is not true. It is not true. The same words were repeated as often as she read the letter. At last, after a long and fervent prayer that was interspersed with agonizing sobs, no bishop or priest prayed with more sincerity that night. She threw herself on the bed, fully dressed, and slept like a punished child that wails itself to dreams. When Gringo called her the following evening, he found the room transformed. The sparse furniture had been rearranged, everything thoroughly cleaned up and tidied, and the decorations done with almost perfect artistry. A light supper of delicacies was ready. But the first thing that had greeted him was Dudu's weeping, to her wild exclamations such as, God, it is not possible. I am your slave. Kill me if you like. Oh, Gringo, you will never know. And so forth. He had answered calmly, using words full of tenderness, understanding and compassion. At last, she had calmed down, fully persuaded, yet still not quite believing that he had forgiven her. If men could but understand, 
if they would only swallow their pride and vanity. The fallen but repented woman makes the best and most honest wife. She has plumbed the depths of misery and agony. She has tasted of the bitter fruit of humiliation and contumely. She has seen herself dirty, deformed and defeated. She has fallen into the pit of worms and she dreads and shuns it forever. She has resurrected from death and has been transfigured. Her mind, soul and personality yearn for purity. The stars and peace are what she yearns for. She has passed through the refining fire and is pure and solid gold. Who can find a more precious ruby than a woman who once fell, agonized and repented? The man who is high enough to stoop and forgive and accept her and has strength to conquer his weakness of vanity and soar above painful memories and cri crippling fears for the future can be her God and impregnable rock of strength and she his devoted and wandering mother and his helpless suckling babe. From that day onwards, these were the unspoken thoughts that occupied their minds, thoughts that were her fervent prayer, thoughts that she tried to hint with utmost delicacy. On their acceptance or rejection depended her future with Tlingo, her very life. Daily, she yearned silently. Does he understand? Will he accept the soul-dripping offer? Daily, he pained in doubt. What shall I do? But my mind was made up the same tragic night. For him, there was another persistent whispering voice. Once falls, always falls. A woman who descends the whole flight of the dark, fearful and stinking steps that lead to damnation, and who, with her eyes open, pollutes her womanhood, can never, never be trusted again. The first descent is so foul and forbidden that she who makes it has lost her soul forever. She has contracted with the devil and cannot be saved. Conflicting voices or none, resolved Klingo. I'll abide by the decision I made that tragic night. In spite of what they thought, they were very kind and considerate to one another. Dudu was not surprised, although a dull and somewhat distant feeling of fear never left her breast, when a month after these events, Tlingo decided that they should get married at once. During this period, she had used all her powers and every subtle method to find out if Tlingo was really the great and forgiving man that he professed to be. She had satisfied herself that he was. As far as she was concerned, he had sealed the whole matter by his broad-minded remarks concerning marriage. She had hinted that under the circumstances, it would be wise to postpone the marriage for some time. First, as a punishment to her. Second, as a test of her pertinence and virtue. Third, as a protection for Klingo himself. To save him from trying himself for life to someone he did not really rely upon. Of course, she had not said all this overnight. She had suggested it by subtle hints. His reply was straight and to the point. It convinced her of his greatness, sincerity, and spirit of forgiveness. He said, Marriage to me is not the end, but the beginning. 
not the seal, but the experiment. Sane, modern and matter-of-fact people should get married. Not because they know and have dissected one another's character, idiosyncrasies and mind, but because they love. Marriage offers them the chance to study, trust and adapt themselves to one another. In these days of freedom for all and of easy divorce, marriage should not be looked upon as a triumph or the end. It is a gateway to a long road. Neither party should be grateful for having achieved marriage. They should be thankful for being given a chance to prove their worth. The true test of love and sincerity, fidelity and character is not the marriage itself but maintaining and making a successful life in marriage. That had convinced her that her real test would come after marriage. She left her work to go home and make preparations. There was great rejoicing at the Tala mission station. Marriage was regarded as a great achievement among these respectable folk. The great preparations, which always present many problems, were carried out with enthusiasm. Fortunately, as far as she could tell, no one else knew about her lamented fall. All would be well if Tlingo kept the secret. And what sane and sensitive man would divulge such a thing about the woman he loves and is going to marry? It was certainly as safe as heaven as far as she was concerned. For what sane and sensitive woman would defile herself, lower her reputation and open a flood of gossip against herself? Tingo had in fact confided in James, his friend. James had remonstrated with him about his plans, but Tingo was adamant. At last, the day came. Amid scenes of beauty and joy, the bride and her train entered the chapel a little after the groom's party had arrived. The choir sang as if inspired, and the music brought a mystic pang of pain to all who listened. Except for James, no one noticed the groom slip quietly out of the chapel. So excited the people were. Just then, a messenger, a young man unknown to all, even to James, entered and handed a note to the bride. There was a tragic pause. Dudu saw and did not see the open note written in the handwriting she knew so well. Take your own poison back. You destroyed my soul that night. This is the revenge of that dead soul. I will not marry a harlot. Kling. Dudu collapsed. The note fluttered from her hand and was caught up by someone. The relatives rushed forward and there were murmurs of surprise and confusion from all sides. The lamentation that soon followed revealed that the contents of the note were being whispered around. Pandemonium followed. A beast-like wail rent the air. The two visitors to the Tala mission station stood dumb and frightened. A woman, the living image of a demon, tore past them. Frightened people from the house out of which she ran stood helpless. One of them said, Lord, I'd rather kill her than torture her like this. Like this. <laughs>